now, it is my great pleasure to introduce our first guest, legendary Alabama native, Rosa Parks. Thank you for being here. I'm thrilled this is my first time to Nebraska. And I, it's been a, a short 20 years since the Montgomery bus boycott. And in that short amount of time, so many myths have grown up about me. I have been called the mother of the modern civil rights movement. And I hope that by, by the time I finish speaking, that you will understand I am not the mother of the modern movement. And that the bus boycott, even that alone, is the work of many, many people. Somehow the, the story has arisen that I was a, a tired little old woman who, who just wasn't going to give up her seat one more time on the bus. Well, first of all, I wasn't old. <laughs> I was 42, and that is the midst of life. And, and being tired, described as tired, kind of brings up images of someone who's been on their feet all day, cleaning white people's houses, taking care of their children, cooking for them. No, I sat down most of the day. I was a seamstress at the Montgomery Fair department store. You, you see, in uh, the era of Jim Crow, colored people could shop in Montgomery Fair, but they could not try on any clothes. If you were white, you could try on clothes, and if they didn't fit, just so, a tailor would be called up from the basement, our department, and he would take measurements and make markings and then bring it down to us, and we would make the adjustments. And the next day, a white customer could come back and bring home their perfectly tailored outfit. So my feet were not tired. I've never been sure how my feet got involved in this story. <laughs> but I was tired. We all were tired of Jim Crow. We've been living with Jim Crow all of our lives for generations from the moment you woke up, the moment you were born until the moment you died. Now, I was raised as any other American child was raised, to think that America was the greatest country in the world, and that it afforded its citizens rights and privileges that no other country could match. But by the time I was six years old, I understood that we were not truly Free. We were not truly acknowledged as citizens of this country. In 1919, I was six years old, and it has been called the Red Summer. Our boys and men who had fought in World War I and won the war were coming home. And those black and brown soldiers were brought home and met with derision and were often beaten, maimed, or even killed for just mentioning that they had fought for their country or for wearing their uniform. That period saw a resurgence of the activity of the Ku Klux Klan, even in Pine Level, Alabama, where I live with my brother, my mother, and her parents. They raised us, Sylvester and me. And during that summer, I remember my grandfather sitting on the front porch of our house during the night with a shotgun across his lap, 
because he had admitted that he didn't know how long he would last, but he would kill the first one of them that stepped on his property. And where was I? I was curled up right at his feet. Because if he was going to shoot that gun, I wanted to see him shoot it. He was not afraid, and neither was I. I, I came by this uh, feistiness quite naturally. You know, my mother and my grandmother were good church-going women, and I went to church with them faithfully. I love God, and I love going to church, the music. It was wonderful. But I understood that I was a child of God, as we all are, and that I deserved the dignity that a child of God should have, and that God would be on my side, and he would be with me. My grandfather, on the other hand, only went to church on certain holidays, but he what his mother was enslaved by his, his father, his white master. And he grew up angry, angry with white people and the situation we were in. He was a big supporter of Marcus Garvey and wanted all of us to go back to Africa where we could be free. But I had his model of being strong and angry and assertive and my mother and grandmother's model of being proud and carrying oneself with dignity and having high expectations. When I was five years old, on my way to school, I ran into a little white boy on skates coming in the opposite direction. He shoved me off the sidewalk. And I got back up on the sidewalk and shoved him back. <laughs> His mother came up to me and said, you push my son again like that and I'll push you so far back into jail, you will never get out. And I said, he pushed me first. And I went on to school. And that evening when I came home and told my family what I had done, they packed up my things and moved me to our cousin's house across town. You see, there I could walk to the colored school and not have to walk through a white neighborhood. By the time I was 10, this white boy named Franklin was threatening Sylvester and me. And he raised his fist and I grabbed a brick and I said, you dare to hurt us and I'll hit you in the head with this. Well, he thought better of it and he went on his way. And when I got home, again, much to my amazement, I was met with Rosa Louise McCauley, you better learn how to talk to white folks or you're going to be lynched before you get out of high school. I told them that I would rather be lynched than live without my dignity. When we talk about Jim Crow, most people think of them as a set of laws meant to separate the races. But they were much more than that. They were laws that were meant to strip us of our dignity, of our sense of humanity, to make us feel less than human. And not only were they mean-spirited laws, they were customs that were enforced as laws. Uh, customs such as not looking a white person in the eye when you spoke with them. Not introducing yourself to them with your last name. Certainly not touching or shaking hands with them. And white people were under the same pressures not to do anything kind to us. Because you were bucking the way things were and you were risking your life to do so, or the life 
of your family. But Jim Crow laws were different from place to place, city to city, state to state. So you never really knew what you were safe doing and what you couldn't do. No, we were tired of Jim Crow. Let me tell you how the buses worked in Montgomery under their set of laws. There were 36 seats on the bus. The first 10 were for whites only. The 10 at the back were for colored only, and it said so over the window at the back. The 16 seats in between were the mixed seats. You could sit there if you were colored, but if a white person wanted the seat, you had to give it up. If a white person sat down across the aisle from you, you had to give up your seat because you were not allowed to sit on the same row as a white person. The bus fare was 10 cents. If you were white, you got on the bus, and paid the bus driver 10 cents, and then you went to your seat right at the front of the bus. If you were colored, you got on and paid your 10 cents at the front, and then got off and went to the back doors to get on. Sometimes it was so crowded in the back that people were standing in the step well. The doors might not be able to open, or close safely. It was not unusual for someone to get caught or even dragged down the street until passengers could get the bus driver to stop. It was not unusual to pay your 10 cents and run into some problems such as the bus pulling away as you were going to get on the back doors and you lost your 10 cents and your ride. Now that's the way the buses worked in Montgomery. It would be a little different in other Jim Crow cities. That day in 1955 when I refused to give up my seat, I was arrested. But I had been thrown off the bus earlier than that in my life. I got on the bus and and paid my 10 cents and looked down and saw that it was far too crowded for me to get off and to get on again safely. So I thought, well, I will just quickly go down the road towards the back of the bus. Some bus drivers accepted that. But on that day, the bus driver called out, where do you think you're going? And I explained the situation. And he said, not on my bus, you're not. And he got up and rushed towards me. And I said, do not strike me. I can get off by myself. And he reached for my arm to pull me. No. And as I went to the front of the bus to get off, I dropped my purse and then sat down on the empty white seat to pick my purse up off the ground. And then I put it over my arm and got off the bus. And I looked at that bus driver and studied his face. And I swore to myself, I will not ride on that man's bus again. And I didn't for 12 years. Well, let me tell you what happened on that day in 1955, I had come out of work, the Montgomery Fair Department store, and I could tell at the bus stop there were so many people there when the Cleveland Street bus came that I would not be able to get on and get a seat, and I wanted a seat. So I crossed the street to Lee's Cut Rate and picked up a few things for home. And as I was paying and getting my change, I looked out the window 
and there was another Cleveland Street bus, and I could easily get a seat. So I got my change, rushed across the street, put in my 10 cents, went to the back door, got on the bus, and sat on one of the mixed seats. Right next to a gentleman whose daughter was in my NAACP Youth Council. I had been secretary of the NAACP chapter in Montgomery for 12 years and started a youth council, and I was <coughs> planning, excuse me, <coughs> planning a workshop for that Saturday. This was Thursday, so I was excited. It was about to happen, and we were having a lovely conversation when the bus filled up. I didn't even notice, but I heard the bus driver say, I need them seats. Everything got quiet on the bus. No one liked it when something like this was about to happen. Make it light on yourselves, he said in the mirror, and give me them seats. Make it light on yourselves. Well, after he said that, the ladies across the aisle got up and squeezed into the back of the bus, and the man I had been talking to stood up. And I turned and let him go by and then I slid into a seat and looked out the window. The bus driver got up and came back to my seat. And he said, you going to give me that seat? And I looked up. And it was the same bus driver that I had been avoiding successfully for 12 years. No. Well, I'm going to have to have you arrested. You may do that. And I sat and waited. The bus was still basically quiet. A few passengers got up grumbling, why well, she have to do that? But, you know, everyone wanted to get home, and this was definitely going to slow things down. Well, two police officers came back after the bus driver had gotten off the bus. I, I think he had just called his supervisor and was advised what to do. And they came back and said, why? Why didn't you give up these seats for the bus driver when he asked? Asked. And I said, why do you always push us around? And one officer said, I don't know why, lady, it's the law but we've got to arrest you. So they took me to North Ripley Street Jail. I was not allowed to call home. They wouldn't even let me get a drink of water. And finally, they put me in a cell with two other colored women. And one was all sulky and growly and, and wouldn't even say one word. And the other one wouldn't shut up. <laughs> She was so excited that someone new was in the cell, and she said, oh, you're married. Your, your husband's going to come get you. And, and I heard her story. Uh, she had been fighting with the man that she lived with and pulled out a hatchet, she says, in self-defense. And he had her arrested, and he was the only one who knew where she was. How, how long have you been here? Fifty-five days she said, waiting for some way to get out. Well, my first thought was, oh my goodness, I hope I'm not here 55 days. What can I do to help you? You're going to get out. You're going to get out, Miss Watson. And we found some paper and pencil. You call my brothers, and, and they'll come and get me. And then miraculously, I, I was allowed to call home. And I talked with Parks. Uh, my husband's name is Raymond, but I always called him Parks. <laughs> and, and Parks said, you're arrested? What, what, are you okay? Did they do anything to you? I'm fine, I said. I just need you to come and get me. Well, I'll get there as soon as I can, as soon as I can get a ride. And not too long afterwards, I, I was released. 
And when I, I went out into the police station, there was E.D. Nixon, the president of the Montgomery chapter of the NAACP, and Virginia and Clifford Durr, who were white, well, he was a white attorney and his wife, and they were allies of ours. And they had come and paid my bail. And then Parks arrived, and we all went back home. This was Thursday night. I still had another day of work, and all I wanted to do was eat and sleep. But before I went upstairs, they said, Rosa, would you be willing to be the case that we try to appeal up to the Supreme Court? And how could I say no? <laughs> I'd been working for just such a thing for 12 years. And they were excited that I was to be the case. Because several other women who were willing to be the case were, were arrested just a few months before I had been. And there was always some problem with the character of these young women. Um, and here I was, married, a church-going woman, always worked hard and, and carried myself with dignity and tried to follow most rules, tried. And it would be clear that the only reason that I had been arrested and that this law existed was because of the color of my skin, not because of my attitude or the way I lived. So I went to bed that night, and the next morning I went back to the Montgomery Fair Department store, and at lunchtime I did what I usually did. I went to volunteer at Fred Gray's office. He was a young attorney. We only had two colored attorneys in Montgomery at that time, and he couldn't afford a secretary, so I did his filing and typing, answered the phone when I could, and we could talk about NAACP business. Well, when I got to his office that Friday, it was a hubbub of activity. There were all these other people there, and it turned out that during the night, Fred Gray, had found out that I was to be the case, and he called Joanne Robinson, who was the president of the Women's Political Council in Montgomery, and she had been planning a boycott ever since she had moved to Montgomery in 1949 and was humiliated, but when she inadvertently, just innocently, broke one of the, the laws on the segregated buses. She said, the best tool we have is a boycott. And so when she found out that I was willing to be the case, she wrote up a flyer that said more or less, um, another Negro woman has been arrested on our buses for breaking the segregation law. We want to show our support of her when her case comes to court on Monday by not riding the buses. If you must go to work or to school and cannot find a ride, please walk. But do not, please do not ride the buses on Monday. Well, she made 35,000. I'm doing this because she, she used a mimeograph machine to make uh, copies of that flyer, got her students to come, had them deliver the flyers to every household in black neighborhoods and, and to all the schools so that they could give them to the students. E.D. Nixon Friday morning, be, before he went to work, he was a Pullman porter and was going to be gone for, for a, a, a trip that weekend, but he, he met with the ministers and begged them to pre, plead the boycott, preach the boycott, I'm so... Sorry, I'm getting tired of speaking. But, <laughs> um, that, that they should preach the boycott from the pulpit on Sunday, which I've got to assume most of them did. 
He also contacted Joe Asbell, a reporter at the Montgomery Advertiser, and said, there's a story here you might want to sneak into the paper. And I don't think either one of them knew that it would be on the front page of the Sunday paper, a printout of Joanne Robinson's flyer. So everyone knew, black and white, what was hopefully going to happen on Monday. Martin likes to tell the story that after his devotions on Monday morning, he came down to the kitchen where Coretta was preparing his breakfast. And he said, Coretta, would you go out and look through the window and see if there's anyone riding the six o'clock bus. And she agreed, and she went out there, and a few minutes went by, and then she said, Mart, you've got to see this. The bus is empty. No one, black or white, <laughs> rode the buses that day. There's a story of the man who had not received the word that we were not to ride the buses. And he went to the bus stop. And, and when he saw the bus come up with two motorcycle policemen behind them, because the mayor had asked that they accompany the buses to ensure that anyone who wanted to ride the buses could. Well, he assumed just the opposite, that the policemen were there to keep us from getting on the bus. So he did not ride the bus. And everyone was there at the bus stop. We had been told that if you wanted a ride, you were to go to the bus stop, and those who had cars or who owned cab companies would come and give you a ride to where you needed to go. So the bus driver would pull up and see all of these people standing there. He would open the door, and they would rush toward the bus and say, no riders here. No riders here. And it would become a chant. No riders here. And the bus driver would close the door and go on to meet the same reception at every bus stop that day. We were told that we were to meet at 7 o'clock at the Holt Street Baptist Church. It was the largest church in our city of Montgomery for black people, for colored folk. And it was packed. People were spilling over into the streets three blocks in any direction from the church. And, and what was going on inside was being relayed on to them. During the day, the Montgomery Improvement Association had been formed. And the new guy in town, Martin Luther King Jr., was chosen president. And when he addressed the group that night, he said, I want to thank you for not riding the buses. Everyone cheered. And I should tell you that there was a law in Alabama against boycotting, which is why we were careful to say not ride the buses instead of boycotting the buses. And so he said, will you be willing to not ride the buses until we get some demands? Yes! Well, these demands were that Negro passengers would be treated with respect. That our mixed seats would be open to anyone who sat in them first, and it would not matter the color. They could keep their seat if they were in it first, which is the way the buses worked in Mobile, Alabama. And the third demand was that they hire Negro bus drivers to drive the the routes through our neighborhoods. We did not ask for an end to segregation, just a modification. But the city said no. The Montgomery Improvement Association agreed to negotiate with them as long as the people from the city were willing to. Well, that went on for several weeks, and they realized that they were not going to get any cooperation from the city. And the people who were not walking needed help and support and care. So they stopped negotiating, left that up to the attorneys. 
and the Montgomery Improvement Association worked on raising the money to fund our own transportation system. We had dispatchers, and I was one of the volunteer dispatchers, that took people to and from from 5.30 in the morning until 12.30 at night. And people walked. People did not shop so much. Christmas uh, was slim pickings that year. And people were getting tired. This went on until January. Early in January, Bob Gretz, of the white minister of a Lutheran, a, a colored Lutheran church in Montgomery, one of our allies, contacted Time Magazine and said, you have a story here that you're not covering. Oh, the, the National Associated Press was sending out reports that there was a boycott going on, but Gretz convinced them that they did not have the full story. And once the media got a hold of our story, they dubbed us Montgomery, the walking city. We were in newspapers, magazines, uh, television news, uh, uh, newsreels in the theaters, and money started pouring in from all <coughs> over the country. And shoes came in, and we needed them. And that was a job for many, to, to distribute the shoes, because people lost their jobs. Uh, you know, they just didn't have the money to replace the shoes that they were wearing out by walking everywhere. That encouraged us to know that there were people out there somewhere who were nameless, faceless people to us who believed in what we were doing. And then, at the end of January, they bombed Martin Luther King Jr.'s house. No one was hurt, but there was damage to the house, and we all got a little more scared. And that night, the NAACP attorneys, Fred Gray, Clifford Durr, uh, Charles Langford, they met and they decided to drop my case. i have gotten stuck in the Alabama court system and was not going to make my way up to the federal appellate system. So they found four other women who had been arrested in that same year but they had turned them down because they did not have the same character qualifications. Well, they needed those women now, and those women were willing to be the case. And they took that case directly to the federal district court. And from there, they were able to appeal the decision which kept supporting the, the state. <laughs> we were, uh, Alabama, we kept appealing until in November, of 1956, the Supreme Court found in our favor that it was unconstitutional to have segregated buses, public transportation. Well, it takes a while for those decisions to go through the necessary paperwork, which was not going to be delivered to the mayor of Montgomery until December 20th. Mm -hmm. And that night, we met again. And this time, Martin Luther King Jr. said, you can ride the buses tomorrow. And you would think that there would be cheering and singing and dancing in the streets. But no. Some people fell to their knees and started praying, others crying. I, I saw grown men, their bodies racked as they sobbed and cried. It had been so long. Not just the 381 days of the boycott, but so long before we, we'd been able to make the tiniest little crack in Jim Crow. So they said, tomorrow, if you choose to ride the bus, you are not to lord it over any white person as if we had won some kind of contest over them. This was a victory, but a victory for humanity, for human respect and rights. So 
Be careful what you say. Do not sit down to a white, next to a white person on purpose with any kind of attitude. Do not say anything to anyone if you are pushed, shoved, spat upon, or beaten. You are to respond non-violently, which had been the credo for the entire boycott. And if you cannot do those things, you are to wait until you can. Well, the next day, all the media was there. They wanted to get pictures of Reverend King and Reverend Abernathy riding on integrated buses. And while they were downtown doing that, Someone said, what about that Mrs. Parks started this whole thing? So they, they came out to Cleveland Court Apartments and um, came to our apartment and asked if they could take a picture of me. And I said, no, I, I don't want any more attention. But they, they begged and they said, We'll just go down to the bus stop, which was just about outside my door. And the very first bus that comes along, we'll get you on it quickly, take a quick picture, and, and then we won't bother you anymore. So I agreed and put on my coat and hat, gloves, and got my purse. And we went downstairs and waited, the photographer and his assistant. The bus came and it was empty, but he couldn't go without a picture. So he said, uh, Miss Parks, get, get on the bus and sit in that very first seat and then slide over next to the window the way you did that day. And, and he had his assistant get in the seat behind me and he took the picture and we got off and I went home. But don't you know, my picture, that was the one they chose for the cover of Look magazine. <laughs> and suddenly that was the iconic picture representing the end of the boycott and the beginning of the civil rights movement. And you know, for me, this one fact convinced me that God has a great sense of humor. <laughs> The bus driver on the bus that day. <laughs> it was the same bus driver who had had me arrested. <laughs> so, I have shared with you some of who I am, I, I think, um, and some of what happened during that year of the boycott, because now we're free to call it a boycott. But um, you may have some questions about things that I have said or questions about things I, I didn't share with you and and I would be happy to hear those questions and I will try to, to answer as as best I can. Yeah. Oh. Thank you so much. I saw two hands here and, and and back there, yes. So. What happened to your position at the, uh, as the seamstress at the fair store? I think it was the Montgomery Fair is what it was called. I continued to work there into January, and then they closed down the tailoring department, and it never opened again. And I have no idea why. <coughs> so I lost that that job. Work was hard for me and my husband to find, who was a parts as a barber. It was hard to find uh, during the year of the boycott, but we were not alone in losing our jobs. Yes. Oh, th there was this lady and then you with the red shirt. Yes. What happens to the woman that you met in jail? Oh, <laughs> yes, yes. And I am so sorry that um, I, I don't remember her name. And I did not recognize her when I saw her after the boycott had begun. She came up to me to thank me, and 
She was a, a different woman. She was clean, dressed well, her hair was done, and, and she thanked me. So I did make that call before I went to work on Friday. The other call I made was to a friend who had a cab company because I was not going to take the bus to work that day. <laughs> yes? Uh, we were able, as a family, to visit Montgomery this summer when we saw where you got on the bus. Oh. Uh, was, it was just very meaningful, especially seeing that it was right near um, where a slave market used to stand. Yes, in, Montgomery in was a, a place of slave trading, for sure, for all of the plantations and... So just, state. I mean, this, this, this isn't necessarily a question about this, but do you have a word of encouragement or advice to the next generation as they're facing something that doesn't seem quite right or fair? I spent a, a lot of my life in Montgomery and now that I'm living in Detroit working with young people. Um, I always feel as though I my generation has been so scarred that things may change, but it's not going to change us. But I do encourage all young people to have, I always hope that they believe in God, <laughs> but to have a knowledge that um, they have value just in and of themselves as being human beings. And they have power, and they have a right to demand change. And that you need to take care of yourselves, but there is strength in numbers to find your allies and not to assume that all of your allies have to look exactly like you and be exactly like you. I have great faith that they will think differently, behave differently, and will move us forward. Mm -hmm. I, I, said, yes. uh, I wanted to thank you. Uh, I wrote you a letter when I was 50 because I just thought I should because you've been such an inspiration to myself my daughter. And you wrote back. And I have shared that letter with many students. So thank you for <laughs> Yes. Oh, certainly. And and I really appreciated the encouragement I receive when I, I get letters like that. I've got to figure out a way to get to Detroit because you told me you must come and see our museum. I'm going to, how am I going to get to Detroit? Uh, so that's my next thing is... Goodness. And that was when you were here in Nebraska? Yeah, it was when I was 50. I'm a little bit older than that now. <laughs> we all are. <laughs> um, so... Now, <clears throat> things happen a lot, and now I can, I was thinking I could go down to UNO at the Black History Professors and ask them if they would have a bus trip that would take me to Detroit, and I, maybe? Maybe, maybe. maybe. But thank you so much. Oh, you're most welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Oh. Two more minutes. Okay. Um, did the initial um, white lawyer and his wife who bailed you out of jail, did they pursue a further avenue um, to civil rights um, progress? Yes, yes. Clifford Durr, as an attorney, uh, worked very hard with the NAACP. And his, his wife was not an attorney, but she was the one who, they were very well connected because they were upper class white people. And she's the one who got me the uh, scholarship to go to the Highlander Folk School that same year that the, the boycott happened. She was very much an encourager. She found me work. You know, uh, they had five children. They were not able to get much income from working for the other white people in Montgomery. So they did not have a lot of money. And with five children, she really could hire me as a seamstress to make the adjustments to the clothing so that things could be passed down. They became very, very good friends of ours during uh, the boycott, especially. And I still stay in touch with her. Yes, uh, well, this gentleman back, are, are you calling on people? I, I, I think two more, maybe this gentleman and then this one here. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Why do you think the city ultimately capitulated 
were they losing money hand over fist, or was it the bad publicity? I mean, I, I find it hard to believe that they were making any money on the bus system. So uh, was it, again, bad publicity, or what? Um, the city never capitulated. They, uh, they, the bus company, which was headquartered in Chicago, cut out a lot of the, the bus routes. And so they tried to cut down their losses that way. Certainly the businesses during Christmas shopping season lost a lot of money as well. Um, there was the effort of the white citizens to form their own bus company. There were uh, several civic groups, the white men of Montgomery. In fact, that was the name of one of them, <laughs> you know, did their best to um, intimidate people who were walking. They took out ads uh, in the newspaper and on billboards saying that the boycott was over, come back and ride the buses. It was only the federal government coming in and saying what you're doing is unconstitutional and you need to change right now. And so they did. And uh, that you're right, they suffered a lot of financial loss, but um, they did not want black people who they had subjugated for so many years to have any kind of victory, to have any, you know, f to feel as though, they didn't want to feel as though they'd lost to them. And there was one other, yes. I was wondering what your relation with Martin Luther King was later on. Oh, and, and, and as of this moment, we, we are, uh, we're still good friends. Um, he very kindly endorsed um, John Conyers for his congressional race in Detroit. Or I shouldn't say endorsed, but Re Representative Conyers had me ask, he, he knew that I knew Martin, ask if he would endorse him. And uh, Martin did not agree to endorse him, but he said enough kind words about him that uh, Representative Conyers won the election. And he is the representative now, and he's the first person since I lost my job at Montgomery Fair to give me a steady job. I'm the administrative assistant who runs his Detroit office. Maybe one. Yes. Okay, then. Well, I guess that's the end of my chance to be with you, but I think there will be someone coming back later who will be able to we can continue this discussion. Thank you so much. What a privilege it is to hear Mrs. Parks' story from Rosa Parks herself. And I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce you to the scholar who portrayed Mrs. Parks, <laughs> Becky Stone. <laughs> Becky holds degrees from Vassar College and Villanova University, and she has been a Chautauquan since 2003, portraying multiple historical figures. She is an accomplished storyteller and joins us from North Carolina. Again, you will have an opportunity to ask questions of Becky as a scholar a little bit later on this evening. Becky, thank you so much. What a pleasure. Really. Oh, thank you.